sure how to start this. This is a lightning round video. 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 C. Christensen wrote, With the CDC saying that one in four adults suffering from some form of disability, myself being a quadriplegic, what are some current accessibility technologies that people should hear about? What are some that you think will make a huge impact? Uh, well, I gotta be honest, as a gratefully able-bodied person, this isn't something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, so this is a bit outside my wheelhouse, but just kind of looking into it a little bit, it looks like there's, you know, some really interesting stuff happening, sort of a conflagration of several different technologies that I think are gonna really make things easier for, for people like yourself in the future. And the first thing I would say is just, you know, all this AI stuff that's going on right now. Um, we're gonna be seeing a lot more AI assistants as they become more, capable of understanding natural language. Uh, there'll be a lot more opportunities for AIs to control different things and kind of help you out just by using your voice. Obviously, when it comes to interfacing with a computer, that's one way of doing it, but also AI assistants that can help you to sort of navigate the world out in the world through phones or other little gadgets. Also, the integration of AI assistance with smart home technology. So you can you know, turn on your lights, lock your doors, do household chores and stuff like that uh, from wherever you might be. There's also some interesting things happening with AR and VR stuff, kind of, especially in a rehabilitation kind of way to kind of help people to be able to work in a, in a safe space and practice motor skills. Like you could actually practice, you know, catching things and moving and, and doing that kind of thing without having to do it in a physical space, like actually throwing balls and stuff like that. Uh, robotics, I covered uh, the whole idea of humanoid robots a while back. Uh, and I was kind of like, where's the point of a humanoid robot? Well, if you had a robot assistant, but then you could have like a, the, the AI assistant in a physical way that could actually go around and wash your dishes, let your dogs out, do that kind of thing. Not to even mention that robotic prosthetics have come a long way. I think stem cell therapies are coming a long way. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff in terms of being able to fix spinal cord injuries with stem cell therapies. Um, I'll link down below to an article from 2022 where they tested uh, rehabilitation therapy along with stem cell grafts in, um, in lab mice. They saw a huge improvement and it shows a lot of promise in people eventually. This has proven to be a, a tougher problem to crack than they thought it would be, um, but there have been some incremental uh, improvements that's been happening and it's, uh, there's some exciting stuff happening there. And last but not least, you know, like just recently FDA approved Neuralink for uh, human trials, the whole brain chip thing. I know Neuralink is a controversial company and everything Elon touches becomes clickbait on either side. And while yes, Neuralink was kind of sold to the public as a way to merge with AI in the far future, in the immediate present, it really could go a long way to helping people with disabilities to, to interact and interface with you know, computers and stuff like that. Um, just giving them the ability to open up to the world in all new ways. There are devices like this that already exist, of course. Neuralink is sort of um, an improvement on that, or it's supposed to be, that's what they're going for. Um, so I'm trying to not get all wrapped up in the hype around Neuralink and just focus on the fact that it could help people in the near future. And I think that's a good thing. Sai asked, what's the current state of CRISPR? It was introduced to the world with massive and probably justifiable fanfare, but it's been a while since the last substantial update. So my first thought when reading that was that uh, there probably hasn't really been much of an update on CRISPR because CRISPR just kind of became a tool that's being used now. It's just like a standard tool. So what's there really to update? <laughs> you know, like, it's like, what's the latest update on screwdrivers? But our resident geneticist Theo over on Patreon pointed me to the fact that there's actually some really interesting things that's going on, some research that combines CRISPR technology with the same mRNA vaccine therapy that was used in the COVID vaccine. And uh, there's some really interesting stuff coming out of it. Uh, in fact, Moderna, who you know famously created the mRNA COVID vaccine, they recently partnered with a company called LifeEdit. And LifeEdit is using CRISPR to perform base editing in DNA, which means basically replacing one single base pair in the DNA to turn on or off a gene. So Moderna wants to do the same thing in RNA to basically custom design vaccines for all kinds of diseases, including cancer. 
The idea is, you know, there's a million different types of cancer, and what makes fighting cancer so hard is that the cancer cells act like our cells, so our immune system doesn't get rid of it. So the idea is, if you could sequence the genetic code of a particular cancer's DNA, you could use CRISPR to create a bespoke mRNA vaccine that would, you know, basically tell the body's immune system how to find and attack the cancer cells and wipe out the cancer cells in the body. I kind of hinted at this back when the COVID vaccines were first coming out. I did a video about how mRNA vaccine technology could maybe, you know, pave the way to uh, not just cancer treatments, but all kinds of things. Diabetes, autoimmune conditions, uh, all kinds of genetic conditions, you name it. And yeah, those things are starting to happen now. Uh, which is really exciting. It's still in the early stages, but hopefully there'll be some more, uh, you know, justifiable fanfare in the near future. Philip Shane asked, Bard or Bing? Oh, Bada Bing! <laughs> Bada Bing! Uh, I kill me. Donna Sawyer asked, Thinking about climate change and the need to move faster, I was thinking about all the times in the past when we did move fast, when something compelling forced us to get it in gear. We have the recent example of the vaccine, but some older examples, forcing the switch to unleaded gas, the child locking bottles after the Tylenol scare, the new airport security after 9-11. What was it about those situations that moved us quickly that's different from where we are now on climate action or inaction? Uh, okay, so this is just my take on it. It's not that heavily researched, so consider this just my opinion, I suppose. Uh, but I think we're basically, I, I think we're just not really evolved to deal with long-term problems. Um, you know, we evolved to avoid getting eaten by a saber-toothed tiger and bears, immediate things, you know? Um, everything you mentioned just then were pretty immediate threats, or at least shocking events that felt very immediate. Basically, we reacted to it quickly because it happened to us quickly. Sometimes I don't even really even blame people for being climate skeptics because it is a very complex issue. There are a lot of variables, it's amorphous, and it's not just like any one thing, it's varying degrees of things. And on top of that, the fact that it's now, you know, become political and it's gotten mixed up in people's identities and their wealthy and entrenched interests who have fought for years to muddy the waters and confuse the conversation. Like, I often wonder if there could be a clarifying moment in the climate change situation, you know, like just like, like one single event that would just shock everybody and bring the whole thing into focus in a way that's undeniable and, you know, cuts through all the clutter. Um, I don't know what that would be though. I mean, even if, say, like, Miami was literally wiped away by a combination of rising sea levels and uh, stronger storms and stuff, there would still be a lot of people who would just think that that's just a natural progression of things, you know, move inland. Sometimes I think the economics of it would spur change because, I mean, even if you don't care about millions of people getting swept out to sea because, you know, you don't live there or whatever, um, the financial toll would be horrendous and it would spur companies and governments to have to spend more money to prevent further loss of money down the line. But I don't know. I was actually just talking to a friend the other day about the movie Don't Look Up. Uh, and, and I know it has its detractors, uh, but I like the way that it took the way we responded to climate change and said, you know, what if we reacted to an immediate threat the same way? Uh, and, and, you know, kind of by reframing it like that, it really showed how ridiculous our response has been so far. So yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll pass this question off to you guys. Like it, it, what, what possible climate change related event could possibly force us all to the table and make the changes that we need to make. Is it possible or are we all just too politically and ideologically divided at this point? It's not a fun thing to think about, but I'm curious what you guys have to say. Like, comment down below. Thomas F. Bolin asked, From whence cometh your comedic sense? What comedians or comedic groups do you enjoy or have you enjoyed? From whence cometh your insolent tone, peasant? So I discovered Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I saw it for the first time when I was 11 or 12 years old, which is the perfect time, 11 or 12 year old boy, that is the, that is the peak demographic for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, I remember I was at a party uh, with some friends of my sisters and um, I have never laughed as hard before or since than the first time that I saw Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I literally thought I was going to die because I couldn't breathe. So it was, I, I just always think about that when people ask where, where my my comic sense is lie, because like, I, I've literally never laughed harder in my life. Then when I was 11 or 12 years old, watching Monty Python for the first time. I wouldn't say that's where I get my comedic sense from, though, necessarily. Um, a lot of things about myself stem from the fact that when I was growing up, I was the smallest kid in my class, and I mean, by a lot. <laughs> uh, so I think my... I think my humor came mostly from being like a defense mechanism. Um, you know, people wouldn't beat me up if I made them laugh kind of thing. Like you can't insult me if I insult myself first kind of thing. 
Uh, but growing up, you know, my, my parents were really strict. There wasn't any language allowed in our house or anything. So I was, no, I was let nowhere near Eddie Murphy or Richard Pryor or anything like that. Uh, but they did let me listen to Bill Cosby. Which, of course, you know, when what has happened to him happened, it was just like, of course, all, all heroes fall, I guess. But, um, it, and, it's, and it's ironic because like Eddie Murphy was so scandalous and everything, but Bill Cosby was clean, but he was, you know, I can't even say what he was doing without getting demonetized. Uh, but you know, as I got a little bit older, I started watching Saturday Night Live. Um, I've always been a big fan of Saturday Night Live. I still enjoy watching it. I'm not one of these people that does the whole like, you know, it's not funny anymore, it used to be funny. They were saying that when Eddie Murphy was on there, like the classic Saturday Night Live that we consider classic today, people at the time were saying that it's not funny anymore. So it's, there's nothing more boring in this world than somebody complaining that Saturday Night Live isn't funny anymore. But the period that I grew up watching it, I mean, I do think was kind of the, the golden age. You know, that was when Mike Myers, Dana Carvey, Chris Farley, Phil Hartman, all those guys were on there. Um, another thing about where I grew up and how I grew up was I grew up in a really small town. There wasn't really anything to do. So I turned to writing. I, I kind of turned to creating characters and, and, and worlds in my own head. And uh, a lot of that writing became comedy writing. Uh, later on in life, I discovered Kids in the Hall. Those were really groundbreaking to me. Um, uh, Mitchell and Webb has become one of my favorite sketch comedy uh, duos. Their, their Mitchell and Webb look stuff is just incredible. Bo Burnham is doing some really cool stuff these days. But yeah, I mean, I guess if I were to point at any one single thing in, in terms of like why I went to toward comedy, it would be, like I said before, I just, I grew up a really small kid. Um, I, uh, that was, that was my way of getting people to like me so that I wouldn't, you know, get beat up or whatever. Um, not that I got beat up a lot, but you know what I mean? It's just, that, that was, that was my way of making friends. And, uh, I don't know. It's, it served me well, I guess. Isaac Hutchison asked, what is your favorite thing in the solar system? And here I mean planet, moon, dwarf planet, structure, like the Oort cloud or asteroid belt, et cetera, et cetera. And why? So I like Titan if for no other reason than because it's the only other place in the solar system that has the same atmospheric pressure that we have here. Um, and it also has lakes, which is a lot of fun. Although those lakes are made of methane because it's negative like 200 degrees or something like that. But if I'm gonna answer one specific thing in the solar system that I like, I would have to go with Olympus Mons because it's just ridiculous. So we have volcanoes here on Earth, but there's a few things here. One is that they do get eroded over time because of rain and atmospheric stuff. Uh, two is that our gravity is higher here, so there's a lot more kind of working to pull it down to, to bring, them, uh, bring them down over time. And three, um, because of our tectonic plates, you know, any kind of magma hotspot might come up over time for billions of years, but because the plates are moving to us, those, those mountains only come up so far. So we have lots of nice mountains, but um, they can't just go out of control in size like Olympus Mons did. Yeah, Mars has none of those things. So Olympus Mons is basically just a magma hotspot that just erupted in the same spot for like billions of years. It's almost three times higher than Mount Everest, more than twice as high as Mauna Kea if you measure from the seafloor. Plus it's on a planet that's about half the size of Earth. So proportionally, if we had an Olympus Mons, it would be 42,185 meters high. 42 kilometers high, that's about 26 miles high. So it just dwarfs everything here on Earth. It's just this big giant zit on Mars that would just had erupted for billions of years. And it's just this, it's, it's, to me, it's just the most insane like planetary feature in, in, the, in the solar system. Feel free to disagree in the comments. Let me know what yours is. Something else I rave about, and actually I get emails from other people raving about, is my razor. So yes, today's video is sponsored by Henson Shaving. Seriously, people tweet at me, leave comments on my videos, even email me telling me that they tried the Henson razor and thanking me because of how much they love it. So look, I work with a lot of sponsors, as you know, I value all of them. They all make this show possible. But honestly, Henson is the only one that people actually thank me for telling them about. And this happens a lot. I think maybe it's because it's not just a good product. It's, it's kind of like a paradigm shift. It's one of those things that makes you look at the way we do things and realize, oh, this makes no sense. Like we've all just gotten used to this idea that the way shaving works is you buy some cheap razor handle and then you purchase these cartridge replacements at $15, $20 a pop and you do that over and over again until you die. And this is how it's always been. Yeah, but this thing, this plastic cartridge with a bunch of flimsy blades in it, this is a relatively new thing and shaving companies have made a killing off of it. But back in the day, people used this with one 
sharp, inexpensive blade, and we think that they switched to this new style because, you know, it's so much better. That is not the reason. It's the money, Lebowski. So what Henson has done is basically just gone back to the way things used to be, but with modern technology. Because they got their start manufacturing parts for aerospace companies. They made parts that are sitting on Mars right now. And then they took that same level of precision and made this just insanely great razor. The trick is the blade is supported all the way across. This cuts down on what they call chatter. That's when the blade skips across the surface of your skin. These cartridge blades, no support. More chatter, more owies. And if the idea of using a safety razor is new and scary to you, they've manufactured this thing so precisely, the blade only sticks out like 27 microns. It's, it's insanely well engineered. So the idea is instead of getting a cheap razor and then getting drained dry for the rest of your life, you drop some money on possibly one of the best designed razors ever made, and in six to eight months, you spent less money than you would have on cartridge blades. In fact, if you go to hensonshaving.com and pick a razor, they've got a variety of styles and colors to choose from, and throw a 100 count box of razors in the cart, and then use the promo code Joe Scott at checkout, you'll get those blades for free. One, 100 blades, and they last between five to seven shaves each. You might not buy blades again for another two years. And then even then, when you do, they're only 10 cents each. So yeah, go see what everyone's raving about and stop getting ripped off. That's hensonshaving.com, promo code Joe Scott. I'll put a link down below. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this video because Google thinks you'll like that one or check out any of the thumbnails on your sidebar if you're watching on the browser. Any of them that have my little thumbnail with my face on them, the little icon, give them a click. If you enjoy them, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. Sometimes with more hair. So that's it for today. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys, take care.